Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, good. I think I'm being with the Okay, okay. How are you, sir? All friends. Hi. Oh, oh, oh hang. <laughs> what a joy to see all of you. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you uh, for joining. Yeah. That is me. Uh, Prof, can we start now? Oh, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Very happy to see you. Prof Johan, Prof Johan uh, joining. Okay. Okay, good. Is that all? Oh, yes. I'm editing the spotlight now. Okay, sure. All right. Okay. Uh, alaikum and good morning, uh, everyone. My name is Zahro, and I'm a research officer at Academy of Professors Malaysia, coming see for today's uh, webinar. It is with pleasure I welcome all of you to uh, APM Emlin Guest Lecture Series entitled The New Maritime Set Road, China and ASEAN, organized by Academy of Professors Malaysia. Uh, before we go any further, uh, I would like to address some housekeeping rules. Uh, firstly, uh, please make sure that you are all in silent or muted mode. And secondly, if participants want to ask the speaker, please submit your questions in the chat box or chat room. Yeah? All right, uh, and only a few questions uh, will be selected by the Secretariat uh, due to time constraint. Yeah? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Professor Datuk Sri uh, Da'e Momanasi Da'e Ibrahim, President Academy of uh, Academy of Professors Malaysia, to deliver his uh, opening remarks. Please uh, welcome. This. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zahrul. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning, everyone. Uh, yang saya hormati, Emeritus Professor Dr. Wang Gungwu, Chairman of East Asian Institute, National University of Singapore or NUS, our today's guest speaker for the Academy of Professors Malaysia eminent guest lecture series. Uh, yang berbahagia, uh, Professor, yang berbahagia, Professor, yang berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Denny Wong Tsukin. Dean, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Malaya, uh, our discussion for the lecture. Yang berbahagia, Emeritus Professor Datuk Dr. Abdul Rahman Embong, former Principal Fellow, ICMAS, UKM, Special Advisor to the Malaysian Social Science Association and Fellow Academy of Professors Malaysia, also our discussion for today's lecture. And uh, Yang Saya Hormati Emeritus Professor Dr. Johan Savaranamutu will be joining us shortly anytime now. And he's a young senior fellow of Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University and fellow Academy of Professor of Malaysia, our moderator for the session. APM council members and APM members, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to thank all of you for attending APM Eminent Guest Lecture Series. APM Eminent Guest Lecture Series is one of the flagship programs organized by APM, apart from several other major programs, such as the APM Fellow Lecture Series, APM Roundtable Discussion, and APM Webinar and Forum called Wachana Academy Professor. This eminent guest lecture series is organized to honor and benefit and to benefit from distinguished scholars and other personalities who have excelled internationally and left an indelible mark with their substantial contribution in their respective fields of knowledge or contributions to the society throughout their career. It also serves as a platform for scholars to discuss strategic issues that will not only benefit policymakers, but also the community as a whole. For your information, APM so far has organized four guest lectures 
delivered by Professor Datuk Dr. Asma Ismail, Professor Dr. John L. Esposito, Distinguished Professor Datuk Dr. Raja Sarasya, and Distinguished Professor Datuk Dr. Shamsul Amri. Today, APM feels extremely honored and privileged that this fifth lecture will be delivered by Emeritus Professor Dr. Wang Gongwu on a very important topic, the new maritime Silk Road, China and ASEAN. As a renowned historian, scholar and thinker, Professor Wang is highly qualified to speak on this topic. Please allow me to read a brief biodata of Professor Wang. Professor Wang Gongwu is a renowned scholar, eminent thinker, public intellectual, historian and teacher who has left an indelible mark with deep and extensive intellectual footprints in the corpus of knowledge on the humanities, namely history, since the second half of the 20th century and well into the third decade of the 21st century. Prof Wang has written many books and articles that focus on China history and the history of Chinese overseas, especially in Southeast Asia. He obtained both his bachelor's and master's degree at the University of Malaya in Singapore and earned his PhD from the London School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London in 1957 at the age of 27. From 1957, he served at the University of Malaya and became Dean of Arts Faculty and Professor of History in his early 30s. In 1968, he went to Canberra to take up the position of Professor of Far Eastern History in the Research School of Pacific and ASEAN Studies or better known as RSPAS at Australian National University where he later served as director of the research school of ANU. He was at the ANU until 1986 and was conferred an emeritus professorship by the ANU in 1988. Prof Wang served as the vice chancellor of the University of Hong Kong from 1986 to the end of 1995. After his retirement from the Hong Kong University, he was appointed chairman of the Institute of East Asian Political Economy in Singapore from 1996 to 1997. Distinguished Professor Fellow, Institute of Southeast Asian Studies from 1996 to 2002, and Director, East Asian Institute and Faculty Professor in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, NUS, from 1997 to 2007. He is currently the Chairman of the East Asian Institute. Prof Wang has received many awards during his long illustrious career. He was awarded the commander of the British Empire, or CBE, by Governor David Wilson of Hong Kong in 1991. He received from the government of Singapore a number of public service awards, including the latest Distinguished Service Award order in 2020. He is also a fellow of the former and former president of the Australian Academy of Humanities, foreign honorary honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, member of the Academia Sinica, and honorary member of the Chinese Academy of Social Science. He has earned many accolades for his work. He was a recipient of the Fukuoka ASEAN Cultural Prize in 1994. In 2007, he was made University Professor of NUS, an honor bestowed to a small number of NUS tenured faculty for their outstanding leadership to the university and community. In recognition of his distinguished scholarship, he has received honor honorary doctorates from many well-known universities around the world, such as Monash University, Australian National University, University of Melbourne, University of Sydney, University of Hull, University of Hong Kong, the Open University of Hong Kong, and the University of Cambridge. He has been invited on numerous occasions to deliver name lectures in prestigious universities all over the world, such as Harvard University, Princeton University, University of Cambridge, Peking University, and many others. Professor Wang is, a, is an icon for the younger and not so young generation of scholars and public intellectuals. His humility, despite the impressive achievement and accolade, is exemplary for all of us. 
You may, you may be interested to know that Prof. Wang was born in Surabaya, but grew up in Ipoh and completed his secondary education in Anderson School there before proceeding to study in the University of Malaya in Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sure you will benefit immensely from Professor Wang's lecture and the commentaries from our two discussants, Professor Datuk Dr. Danny Wong Sir Ken and Emeritus Professor Datuk Dr. Abdul Rahman Embo. And this entire discourse will be in the good hands of our moderator, Emeritus Professor Dr. Johan Severinamutu. Thank you. I shall now hand over the session to the MC. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sreen. Um, now I would like to invite Emeritus Professor Dr. Johan Saramanamutu, a fellow academic of Professors Malaysia to moderate the webinar. Please welcome, uh, Prof. Johan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yang berbahagia, Professor Datuk, uh, Datuk Sri, uh, Dr. Daeng Muhammad Nasir, uh, yang dihormati Emeritus Professor, Professor Dr. Wang Gangwu, uh, very welcome to join us today. Yang berbahagia, uh, Professor Dato, uh, Dr. Danny Wong, uh, Dean of Faculty of Arts, Social Sciences UM, and my good friend Yang berbahagia, Emeritus Professor Dato, Dr. Abdul Rahman Ambong, uh, former Principal Fellow of IGMAS, uh, and uh, members of the Council of the Academy of uh, Professors of Malaysia, my good friends, colleagues, uh, APM members, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is indeed a very great honor for me to moderate this uh, session of Professor Wang Gang Wu uh, on the uh, Maritime Silk Route and its connections with the, uh, the, the new Silk Route uh, today. Uh, I, uh, you know, we, I've known Professor Wang for a number of years. We worked together in the uh, Asian Scholarship Foundation uh, to encourage young scholars to receive scholarships and, and to, to, you know, to show their, uh, to, 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 to sort of develop their own research and so on. So uh, it's indeed, I think, uh, uh, you know, a pleasure for me to do this. And Professor Wang Gangwu, of course, is the most uh, qualified person to speak about this uh, in our midst, I think. Uh, he's, he's been a scholar as a pro uh, Professor uh, Dying has mentioned uh, of 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 the of the region. Uh, he's he's a scholar of China. He studied Chinese history. Uh, I don't really want to preempt the uh, discussion by giving the overview of the lecture or anything. I think the uh, the maritime silk route has been with us for years and years and years. Uh, into, you know, over the over time, and it has influenced our history. It's influenced our cultures uh, in this part of the world. And now we have something called a the Belt and Road Initiative that is uh, launched by the, uh, the current uh, government or the current uh, uh, political system of China. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Wang Gangwu will be, I think, drawing these connections between the old Silk Road and the new Maritime Silk Road. Now, I think the, uh, the discussions have already been introduced, uh, but I'll just very quickly mention Professor Dato Dani Wong, of course, is a professor of history at the Department of, of History and Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, the University of Malaya. He's a distinguished scholar of history. He's taught Southeast Asian history. He's currently the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Uh, then we have uh, Professor uh, Dr. 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 Rahman Ambong, a wonderful scholar uh, of the social sciences. Uh, he's a professor of development sociology. I think many of you already know him. so. I don't have to uh, go on uh, uh, giving you more uh, information about him. Now, I'll just very quickly, uh, you know, mention the format of the of the proceedings. So, uh, Professor Wang will speak for about an hour or so, uh, after which uh, there will be discussions by our two discussants for about thirty minutes or so. Uh, Dr. Danny and then Dr. Raman will speak, uh, and then we will have another round of about twenty-five minutes where. Uh, when Professor Wang will, both, uh, will be responding to both uh, discussions. And then finally, we'll have Q&A uh, with, uh, with the participants. So without further ado, may I have the privilege and honor to, provide, uh, to, to invite uh, Professor Wang uh, to, 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 to speak to us now. 
Thank you very much for all of you. I'm really greatly honored, uh, President of the Academy, uh, Professor Dain Mohammed Nasir, really honored to be participating in the Academy for the first time. I'm delighted to learn how well it's doing and how distinct, what a distinguished group of people come together for the Academy and truly grateful to be invited. The subject you have chosen of course is very close to my interests. Indeed, uh, I started life at the University of Malaya with my first project on the Nanhai trade, which is about China's trade with in the South China Sea. Uh, at least the title itself sounds very modern, but actually that was, I started 2000 years ago. So that, that's the background I come from. But I won't uh, really concentrate on the past, although I am here as a historian, and I know you invited me as a historian, the, 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 the word that leads me to change my focus somewhat is the word new. I mean, you put into the title, the new maritime Silk Route. And I will, I will come back to this word again. The newness of course rests on the fact that it is not just the route is new, but there are so many new factors to play in play. ASEAN is in the title, ASEAN is new, very new. China as represented there is also very new. There's a new China, quite different in many ways from the old China. So that the, new, the word new applies to all three. But let me go back a little bit. I would say the subject is so interesting and so and covers such a lot, large area that I think it would be wiser to take them in parts. I think it, it'll helpful, it is helpful to take them in parts. So I will begin with ASEAN in the context of Southeast Asia as a region. What is this region? Because that's, that's to me extremely central to the whole story. And China, this new China is a great power again after about 200 years when it was very, very weak and divided. And then do we talk about China rising? This is new, but I think that will be a second part of, of, the, of what I'm going to talk about. And finally, I'll come back to this newness of the, of the maritime Silk Route. So let me begin with ASEAN. ASEAN actually refers to Southeast Asia. And the two names are often taken together, but I think we should be very clear that they are very different in many ways. And I would like to begin with Southeast Asia. We all know when we talk about Southeast Asia, we all know which are, which, which are the countries we, we refer to. But what is the most interesting thing about this region was that for thousands of years while they, the, the region has been there, it never had one single identity. It never had one single name. And this is itself such so an intriguing question that many, many historians have spent their careers and lives trying to figure out, first of all, to what extent it was a region and to the extent that it was a region, why did it never, did it never have a single name that they all commonly adopted? So that has in itself raises a lot of questions which affect its present as well. I think this is related. So that, that alone, it gives me my historical background to Southeast Asia. ASEAN is so new, we dated from 1967. Some people can say we dated from 1999 when all 10 countries became members of ASEAN. But to go back a little bit, Southeast Asia itself as a name came to us really after, nine, after the Second World War. It was sometime during the middle of the Second World War that it was the term was used essentially used by strategists for the former empires. Looking at the terrains, the lands that they were about to leave, and when they saw themselves having to leave, how would they maintain any influence in the area? And so that's, I think, the starting point. So they named it Southeast Asia. And having given it a name, books were written. And since then, of course, there have been hundreds of books, thousands of articles written about this area called Southeast Asia. So we've now accepted the name. But if you go through all those articles, you'll see again and again references to the question why it did not have an identity before. Why was it so difficult 
to see it as a region prior to 1945 or after 1945. And so looking back at that, it requires us to look back a little at how it all began. Because when you look at it this way, from the very beginning, it was quite clear that the sea was different from the land. Hurt people by some are different peoples who had different, uh, devised different cultures of their own, creating, in fact, different kinds of states, in fact, absorbing different religions, and in fact, living lives which were in many ways quite distinct from one another. But today we take, we take them all as regions, but we have to go back to recall what it was like to begin with. So we do realize that right from the beginning, there were people indigenous to the region which were different on the continent, roughly the areas between, uh, between Vietnam and Burma down to the Thailand, and then the ocean, the sea. They, these are very different people right from the beginning. But from the time we had records, we could see that these differences were accentuated by the fact that the people actually came from different directions. And the, the people who, on land came down river valleys from the north, in fact, from the continent, way up north in the, in the middle of Central Asia, so to speak, coming down the river valleys into the Sawin, the Irrawaddy, the Neman, Man, Man, down to the uh, Mekong, and also to some extent also you can include the Red River of, of northern Vietnam, all coming from the north. And they were very different peoples. And they were different from the in, indigenous people who we found there, people who we today we recognize them through their language. What they had in common was the Mon Khmer, also Asiatic languages, from which we derive today languages of Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, uh, Myanmar, Mon, Mon, Mon languages in Myanmar. And then had a different lot of people coming, bearing with them different cultures, different language, and different systems of, uh, of governance among themselves. And we had people who are essentially Tibeto-Burman language speaking people, and people who were what did not what recognize as Thai, but Thai is a kind of related, half related to the Hmong Khmer, but half related to the Sino-Tibetan family of languages, but coming from the north, down the river valleys. Now this is one lot of people and they remain more or less stationed in their river valleys, did not really look to the sea. A little bit of the Khmer Empire eventually did, but at the sea, people also coming from the north, but from South China, from South China, Southwest China, but turning to the sea via the Taiwan, to via the Philippines, via the coast of Vietnam, down into Southeast Asia, people whom we now identify more or less through the languages they had in common origin, the Malayo-Polynesian peoples who spread amazingly halfway around the world, as we know, all the way to Hawaii and the other one, Hawaii and Easter Islands on one end and the other end to Madagascar to, to the African coast. And this extraordinary mobile maritime people who were committed right from the beginning to the sea and never really were comfortable when they go from, in, into the interior. And, but, but very comfortable at the river mouth, which they control or any, any river they could find on the river mouth, you'll find them settled there. And they lived at, on the sea, lived by the sea and lived on what the sea could produce for them, including the trade and all the relationships which could easily be brought together because the sea was really open. Something you can move very easily along, unlike land which is different, especially when it's river valleys with different va river valleys with, with lots of highlands, uplands, mountains in between, which, re which restrict uh, re relationships very strongly. So right from the beginning, they were so different. So that we know, at least that is one reason why nobody quite saw them as part of one region. They're obviously not that, that much in common amongst them. So you can see how, what a struggle it was for the whole several generations of historians now since the 1950s, they're trying to make this Southeast Asia a region. But to the extent they have succeeded, and this is something we can come back to, this is itself very important. But let me just quickly run through the thing. The historians showed that through that time, of course, gradually as the trade grew, as the people who were involved in the trade were interconnecting inter with one another, those who came from the West, 
from the subcontinent of India, further west from Persia and Arab and Arab world, trading down across the Indian Ocean to Savarabhumi, the land of gold, and so on. On the one hand, and others reaching out for China because China was already known to be a united, powerful state, one of the richest in the world from very early on, and therefore attracting merchants from from all over, overland as well as maritime. And that trade gave a, a tremendous focus for the peoples of the maritime coast of, of uh, this region, uh, we, which we haven't, has still hasn't got a name, but this maritime area where all these maritime peoples performed a major central role to keep this trade going. And that was how it all began. And because that trade developed, because on the one hand, the people from the West, the Indians, the Hindu Buddhists, and later on the Muslims from Persia and, 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 and Arab world and add a tremendous amount of activity to this trade and extending it to China and Eastern Asia. And on the other hand, the Chinese taking an interest, but bearing in mind, the Chinese were never fully interested in the South. They were, China was a Northern continental power. And I'll come back to that later, but go back to Southeast Asia. With that background, it is no wonder that nobody really seriously thought about it as a region. This was an area of openness. Trade was free, religious ideas, ideas about politics, ideas about life, about philosophy, about architecture, about art, music, dance, were transmitted very readily, particularly from the West. First from the South continent, uh, South, uh, South Asian continent, so the Indian subcontinent, and then later on for further West from the Middle East in general. And the Chinese on, on the other hand, did not transmit that so much as they were trading. Economic activities grew steadily. And by about a thousand years ago, it became a, a serious occupation for the merchants of Southern China. But just to, as a footnote there, they were only by the merchants. The state itself, the Chinese imperial state itself, took relatively little interest in this part of the world in compared to, compared to the others. Now that is the background before the coming of the Europeans. But we, what we do know, what the historians have managed to show in the last few decades was that that period just before the arrival of the Europeans, the region was taking shape, not very closely related to the, between the land powers and the maritime powers, but they were taking shape because they were sharing that trade that was growing steadily largely led by that time, largely led by Muslim traders from the Middle East and the Chinese traders coming from Southern China, particularly the province of Fujian, but also Guangdong, those two provinces. Those two provinces plus the Middle East via South India made this trade a flourishing trade for the peoples who lived in this area. The, the, the maritime world, which we we can now say in a way the kind of Malay world, if using Malay in the broadest possible sense of Nusantara, right across from the Malay Peninsula, Sumatra Malay Peninsula, right across to the Philippines and beyond. So that part of the, the role was already being very well developed prior to the arrival of the Portuguese. So the arrival of the Europeans did not change the picture. The arrival of the Europeans was to add one more actor, one more, one more set of actors uh, whether they're Portuguese, Spanish, and later Dutch, and finally the English, they added some more actors, but the pattern of trade, the way the trade was conducted, the way the Chinese and the Muslim traders continued mm. to play key roles in that uh, spread of the Western influence and Western commercial interest in the area, that part did not fundamentally change. It simply it was expanded, intensified, and more involving these foreign uh, merchants with powerful ships. And this is the changing factor. The new factor was they had powerful ships. They knew how to fight by, at sea more, in more sophisticated and technologically advanced ways than anybody else in the region. And gradually, after about 150 years or so, that naval uh, advantage gave them a kind of dominance, a kind of beginnings of a hegemonic position that naval power began to dominate the area. 
And what it meant essentially was whoever had naval power could actually dominate that trade. Trade was no longer in the hands purely of innocent merchants seeking profit, but it was more than, more than merchants, merchants who also had a mission, whether it was a Christian mission by the Portuguese and the Spanish or, or a really economic uh, commercial mission of the Dutch. And finally, with the development of industrial capitalism in England, and France and so on, the coming of industrial capitalist uh, finance, different kind of funding, different kind of involvement, and the scale and intensity of that trade grew. Now that's that part of it. But you can see there was no fundamental change until industrial capitalism completely changed the nature of economic uh, production and the forces of these new forces of production completely transformed the way the trade was conducted, the markets were found, resources, new resources were, 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 were transported long distances to enable that the industrial capitalists to gain even further advantage over the centuries. So this is the background. So you can see that the turning point was naval power. And I don't mean just mercantile ships, this is naval power. Ships that are able to fight at sea and win at win their wars at sea. And the greatest wars fought, fought among the, the navies were not amongst between the Europeans and the Asians. They were, the greatest wars were actually fought among themselves, whether it was the Dutch against the Portuguese, or against the Spanish, or and then the Dutch against the English. And finally, the most important one, the decisive battles, which gave the British complete superiority at sea when they defeated the French in the Indian Ocean. At that point, when the two industrial powers of India, England and France had the final competition in the Indian Ocean and the British won and took over control over Indian Ocean. By that time, of course, they, from the other side, the uh, Americans had already pushed into the Pacific. So we are, we are beginning to talk about an Anglo-American partnership on both sides in, in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. In fact, the British Navy controlled everything. The Americans were really, uh, at that point, some supporting role for the British Navy. But that change from the late 18th century down to the First World War would totally transform the, the, the story of this part of the world. And even then, it was interesting that nobody could agree on a single name for this region. That itself, again, is very, to me, <laughs> as a historian, very intriguing. They still did not agree on a single name. In fact, different names are used. I mean, for the maritime world, they use Malaysia. And for the mainland, they use Indochina because just between those areas between India and China on the continent. And these names is never quite, quite carried. And then eventually, because Japan responded and China, the Chinese traders became partners in some of these enterprises, took advantage of some of these opportunities for them to advance their interests. More and more Chinese merchants are involved and more and more interests and therefore, new terms arose both in China and Japan. Nanyo for the Japanese and Nanyang for the Chinese, both meaning the same, meaning Southern Ocean. For the first time, a sort of name, a common name was invented, but they were really invented for the maritime power, maritime states, for all those ports that faced the South China Sea or the East, East Java Sea or, or, or the Indian Ocean, but not really for the overland the, uh, northern parts of what we call Southeast Asia today. But then so at least one common name emerged. But that of course led ultimately, to, just to cut a long story short, ultimately to the Japanese challenging Western dominance in this part of the world. But the Japanese had learned from the West, they learned it too well, they shared some of the ambitions, but they also took on the idea that Asia should be for the Asians. There was this kind of idea of of uh, Asianism, which is superior to these uh, materialistic uh, capitalists from the West, uh, Asians as, as a spiritual uh, civilizations, which are which should, which should be supported, and we should drive these Europeans out of Asia. So the Japan led something which quite a few other Asian leaders also sympathize with, that we should really get the Europeans out of this part of the world, and so the Asians can look after themselves thereafter. Except the Japanese, they went too far went too fast and whether they were sincere about really 
uh, leaving Asia to the Asians or whether it was Asia for the Japanese, but that's another argument. But nevertheless, they started a war that they couldn't win. So that ended that story. Nanyo is no longer used in that context. But what it did do, and this is the part that very often we forget, it was Japan that showed that the whole of Southeast Asia could be ruled by one empire. One power could control all of it, and they did. In fact, if you look around, all the 10 members of ASEAN today were directly or indirectly under Japanese administration. In some cases, military administration, in other more civilian, but nevertheless, under Japanese administration for at least three years, if not three and a half years. And during that time, of course, it was fighting, fighting on the Burma front and fighting at the Philippines, at the, off the coast of the Philippines at sea, but nevertheless, the Japanese actually saw a region. Of course, they linked it up with the East Asia co-prosperity sphere, so we didn't quite recognize it as such, but actually it took, it looked at Southeast Asia as one region controlled from their headquarters in Taiwan. In fact, the governor general's office in Taipei uh, uh, under the Japanese was actually the headquarters for the Southeast Asia that the Japanese controlled. But they failed, right? The war ended, they lost. But it was exactly during that time that the imperialists who knew that after the war, things would be different, and they predicted that, they foresaw, foresaw it, that the British strategists, the great imperialists, of the, the greatest imperialists of its day, began to see, look for ways and means of retaining their influence after they were forced to go home, as it were, and and decolonize and let the new nations uh, establish themselves, which they saw eventually they would have to do, particularly when they saw they had to leave India. That for the British, they, they, they were realistic enough to see that. And they used the word which they used for, at that time, purely military context, Southeast Asia Command, to devise this idea that when the imperialists leave, what would happen? By that time, it was clear that China as an ally of the allied, of the allied groups against Japan was emerging as a new power, nationalist China, not communist China, nationalist China under Chiang Kai-shek. Of course, they, after all, he had met, that Chiang Kai-shek had met Churchill and Roosevelt in Cairo as equals, and they were going to take over this part of the world once they defeated the Japanese. That was also obvious. So the British saw that a rising nationalist China was going to be a, a power to, rec to reckon with. And if they left India, of course they didn't know then that they would partition India, but if they left India, British India in the hands of Indian nationalists will be a power in the future. So to their thinking, strategic thinking, it was quite clear that the future, if they want to have any influence in their former territories around there, they have to watch out for these two Asian powers to come. China to the north and India to the west. And they needed some way whereby this region could be defended or protected and protecting their interests in the region. And the name Southeast Asia emerged as it were, as a favorite name. It was still un not clearly defined because as you, some of you remember when Professor D.G. Hall wrote this, his history of Southeast Asia, he did not include the Philippines because the Philippines wasn't part of the Southeast Asia Command under the British, led by the British, because Philippines was part of the Pacific Command uh, led by the Americans. But eventually, both sides, both the British and the Americans, when decolonization was inevitable, both sides recognized that they should look at the whole region together and the Philippines was added and Southeast Asia became the potentially the 10 countries that we have today. So that was done geographically marked out, and the, ma the, the maps begin to show this. Until then, there was no such, there's no map when you, you actually saw this region as seen as a, as, a, as a region. From then onwards, I would say, I would almost call it a post-imperial mission to make this region real. The people within the region were not conscious of it, did not actually see this as urgent because they had their own problems of nation building. This was uh, much more urgent, much more important to them. 
and they devoted all their energies to build up the new nations that they have taken over as colonial states or revolutionary states, Indonesian and Vietnamese or revolutionary state, as they were trying to build their nations, they weren't thinking of the region. So the only people who seriously thought about the region were people from outside, particularly the British strategists, but joined later on by the Americans and the French and others who could gradually all come to realize that this was the one way they could protect their interests in a region outside of China and India, the future Asian powers. And this is pretty good strategy thinking. I mean, you look back on it, these people had imagination. They had a long view. It's, it's a mistake to think that uh, our Westerners have only a short term view and only the Asians and Chinese are, are long, long view people. There were great strategies in the West, particularly among the British. The Europeans were much better than the Americans there, who had a long view. And their long view was this area had to be separated or separately considered and protected where their interests were concerned from being dominated by either India or China or both. And of course, Britain had a special interest because it also had possessions or the dominions in Australia and New Zealand. So this is part of their extensive naval and maritime, global maritime empire. So they, they had even extra reasons but so did the Americans. They were also interested in, in East Asia in generally, in general, the Pacific area in general, and therefore the, the two combined in, 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 in deciding that Southeast Asia will be a focus of regional development to make itself a region, and to make this into a region that they could, they could defend. I think that is important to bear in mind. So when we talk about ASEAN today, we recognize that with the Cold War, the region was not, it was not possible to see it as one. Almost straight away from day one, as it were, the, of the Cold War coming to Asia, Southeast Asia was divided. And one half of Southeast Asia, and these are the, the, the events of very critical events. Let me, let me list them to my mind, the three most critical events that shaped what we call ASEAN and what, it, what is Southeast Asia today, the beginnings of it. The first was the fact that, uh, that uh, Indonesia turned capitalist under Suharto, destroying the Sukarno heritage, destroying the Communist Party of Indonesia totally, and then realigned with the capitalist camp and the other four members who were also in a way forced to take sides under those, those conditions. The Cold War was become very, very fierce, very intense, particularly on the mainland in Indochina and the beginnings of the Vietnam War. And the, 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 the region was divided and half of it became aligned to one side. The other half was a little bit more mixed, but nevertheless, the half that was aligned was a source of the new Southeast Asian regionalism. Only half a region was ASEAN, I would call it ASEAN one, five, five countries very clearly aligned to one side in the Cold War. The second event, of course, is very, uh, very significant to my mind, was the recognition of the PRC. Uh, you recall that when the Kuomintang fell and the communists took over, uh, China was left out of a lot of things, particularly by the allied forces in the Cold War. China was not a member of the United Nations and so on. But in, soon after the overthrow of Sukarno, forces of the left began to recognize the need to put PRC, the People's Republic, in place of the Republic of China that merely controlled the island of Taiwan. This movement had been going on for some time, but it finally succeeded in 19, early 1970s. It allowed Nixon to go to China and it allowed the Americans to draw or to help China escape from being dominated by Soviet Russia. So in, in a way, it completely changed the shape of the Cold War itself. It, it pulled China out of the Soviet, um, under the Soviet umbrella, and that created new conditions for the region to survive, to, to take a different life, a different role of China to coming in. But the third event, which was even more surprising to most of us, I think, I, I don't know how many of you would remember when it happened, was the defeat of the United States in Vietnam that the US and its allies were forced out of Vietnam. Now, when that happened, 
this is tr truly different. And I think there was a lot of uncertainty as to what would follow. But what is clear is that for the next 20 or 30 years, that half ASEAN of five members with Brunei joining later, that half ASEAN began to find that it, it, has, it can have agency. It is not just a pawn or a puppet of one side of the Cold War. It could have agency because it could also turn to China. You re recall the countries like Malaysia and eventually Philippines and Thailand actually recognized the People's Republic of China during that period. I mean, the only country that refused to do it was Indonesia because of the, of the Communist uh, Party of Indonesia and Singapore, just want to be on the safe side, uh, waited for Indonesia. But three out of the five actually established diplomatic relations with China. And that indicated they had some agency and that encouraged them to develop an ASEAN that at least with every intention to be autonomous, to have greater autonomy, and not to be aligned to one side or the other. Very interesting, because it was not, not easy at that stage to see how this would go. But then what happened was the Indochina wars between Vietnam and Cambodia, Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia, destruction of Pol Pot's uh, group of uh, Khmer Rouge, and then the recreation of a new state of Laos and Cambodia as separate and independent of Vietnam, with ASEAN, at least those five countries, playing a role, joining the United States and China in playing a role in determining the fate of Cambodia in that, in that situation. All that led to two, to me, very important things. One was that it confirmed that ASEAN can have agency if it played its cards right, if it stuck together, and if it worked out some strategy to maintain its autonomy in that region. And it worked. And the net result was, to everyone's surprise, a real ASEAN. All 10 members joined ASEAN by the 1990s, uh, with Cambodia uh, right at the end of 1999. Now we have, I would say, ASEAN 2. This is the real ASEAN of 10 countries completely reframing themselves as an autonomous body, a region that can exercise agency, determining its own fate, finding its own position in between great powers, whoever they may be. All those powers, North, South, West, East, they have some room to maneuver. And that I think is a great start. Now in that context, we see China emerging. So I will end on this part on ASEAN. What was new was now we see an ASEAN with agency. Now that meant that China no longer saw ASEAN as a, a creature of the West, anti-communist, and just determined to be anti-China, as it once did. Instead of which they saw an autonomous region agency that the Chinese could now help to bring closer to themselves and to show that they are actually in support of and totally in sympathy with this autonomous region of Southeast Asia. And you recall how the, when the China joined the WTO and so on, how much, how much effort they put into befriending uh, ASEAN and accepting ASEAN's invitation to form ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus one, and all the open efforts to include, include more people in this, in the larger region, so that the region of Southeast Asia would have a bigger role to play, a bigger playground to play in, so to speak, a good, bigger arena to be active in. And that was a very successful period of ASEAN. You remember the days of ASEAN Charter, tremendous expectations of, of ASEAN to do this or that. And uh, uh, I should say the, the many of the uh, foreign officers, officers of the 10 countries were genuinely, I think, hoping that this will end up with a body that could really act together very effectively and play a role in regional and world affairs. I think I'll leave it at that to say that is the new ASEAN. And this is new for the Chinese. This was an opportunity which they never had before, never thought of before. Because in before, as I said, if you go back to Chinese history, what was so new to China was that it looked south for the first time, seriously. Prior to that, the Chinese arrived off the coast of China, the South China Sea, and they stopped. 
they got they they got hold of they, they conquered parts of North Vietnam, which is now uh, which was now independent. But at that time, for uh, nearly a thousand years, it was a protectorate of the of the Chinese, and eventually got its independence. But the Chinese actually never moved south. All their problems were in the north. All the enemies, all the threats, and we we know that. If you look at all of Chinese history, almost ninety percent of the material is about North China, down right down to the I would say down to modern times. Almost ninety percent of all the materials is to do with Northern China and its, and its problems uh, uh, from Central Asia and Northern Asia. Very little about South, largely for the very simple reason the Chinese found no enemies out there. The relatively small countries interested in trade, providing a, ma a major trading route with the Indian Ocean states. Uh, everybody was more or less satisfied with the conditions there. There were no great navies threatening anybody. Nobody was changing the map you know, in any, any way that was threatening to China. So China took less and less notice over time. In fact, they did not pay much attention really. And in my view, until they were forced to, when they were half conquered, most of North China had been taken over. The, the Song Dynasty was driven to the south and the Southern Song out of economic necessity had to depend on encouraging trade with Southeast Asia to survive economically. So the taxes from the, from the merchants as it were could be part of the regular revenues of the state. And then they began to take notice of the South so that a thousand years ago, roughly a thousand years ago, when the Song Dynasty was under threat from the north, they, more and more the merchants in Fujian and Guangdong were encouraged to trade. And that developed slowly and gradually into a, a very active trade in which the Muslims, coming particularly the Muslims from uh, the Middle East and the Chinese developed a very close relationship. Not always friendly, they were rivals, competitors and so on, but it was a very rich relationship over centuries. And it, that went along very well and reached a climax when the Mongols conquered China, all of China. And the whole of South China was taken by the Mongols. Now the difference was this, the Mongol conquest made a big difference to the story in China. Because for the first time since the Mongols came from the North and conquered China from the North, the North was not a problem for the Mongols. The Mongols, Mongols were interested in the South, how, how far they can go further South. And when they found that the Chinese had a navy of a sort, the Song Navy, which was built not to develop to fight against the South, the Song Navy was about to defend itself against the North. The Mongols took over the Chinese Navy, got the Chinese sailors and so on to help them to go to Java, to go to Champa, to, on the Vietnam coast. And they were actually actively and just using the Chinese Navy for a purpose that the Chinese never intended. And that, that's itself very interesting. But the Mongol interest was a totally different one. They even used the Chinese Navy and with the help of Koreans as well to try and attack Japan. I mean, that's a kind of Mongol mind that whatever is there, they ought to take it. So that's, that's how it was. A different worldview had come in. That changed the picture a great deal. So when we come to Chinese Navy under Admiral Zheng He going south and so on, going, going to the Indian Ocean, that was not something initiated by the Chinese. I would say that was made possible and even imaginable by the fact that the Mongols had created a regular, very active relationship with the Middle East, with the Mongol expanding in the Middle East. In fact, the, the, the Mongols were reaching out to their own people uh, on the other side, which was uh, in, in the Persian Gulf. And so when the Ming took over from the Mongols after getting rid of the Mongols, the Ming inherited that. And the Yomlo emperor who was uh, dealing with the Mongols in the North took over the Mongol role to find out what was happening in the Mongol empire in the Middle East. And he sent Zheng He out to find out. So this all related. I won't go into that because the net result was that at the end of it all, after eight voyages, after, the eight, well, after seven voyages, with the eight voyages, they decided that it's not worth it. All that expense, there were no enemies out there. And if there are no enemies out there, why all this expense keeping up this Navy? For, 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 for what purpose? Nothing to gain. Leave it to the merchants at all, if at all, leave it to the foreign merchants. In fact, the Ming Dynasty actually took over a policy, took on a policy which became very hurtful to, to its future without knowing it. And that was it banned maritime trade for Chinese merchants. People forget that. People think of the Ming as 
because of Zheng He, I think the Ming was a time when the, the Ming Empire expanded its naval uh, influence everywhere. Not at all. They, they, they stopped the Navy, destroyed the ships, and limited foreign trade to the hands of foreigners coming to China and not allowing the Chinese merchants to go out to trade. They can trade with the foreigners when they arrive in China, but they cannot go out to trade. And they, all that trade was then left in the hands of a tributary system, which they refined and bureaucratized, institutionalized into something very elaborate to control and guide the trade. Now, that's a, that's a different story. But you know, the background therefore you can see that when the Europeans arrived, the Chinese were nowhere to be seen except as merchants traveling all over the place, very active, but no naval power, no backing from the state, no, in fact, no recognition by the state. In, in many ways, some of those merchants were illegally trading outside. And once they go out there illegally, they can't even go back to China without endangering their lives. So that was a, a situation in which the Europeans were able to build, move themselves into the system together with Muslim traders, Chinese traders, Indian traders, in indigenous Southeast Asian, Malay, world, Thai, and other traders, and gradually building their influence until they, they became, became the dominant force. So that is the background. And the Chinese paid no attention until it was too late. And, and again, one can go on, but the Opium War changed everything. The opening of China transformed the Chinese. For the first time, they were really defeated at sea and the country was endangered from the sea. There were enemies out at sea for the first time. And, and that was complete shock to the Chinese. They didn't really take it all that seriously to begin with, but by the end of the 19th century, it was quite clear that the lack of a Navy was absolutely crucial. It was in fact threatening to its own very existence when the Japanese Navy trained by the British were able to destroy what was left of the Chinese Navy in, in just one set of wars. And thereafter, the Chinese Navy disappeared for a whole century. No serious talk about Chinese Navy until the 1990s. And what kind of naval power was that? Yet at the same time, for China, whether it was under the late Manchu period or the nationalists or the communists, they were all aware that the sea was no longer a peaceful place. The sea was a threat. Foreign navies can attack China and China was vulnerable. That changed their worldview. I mean, this is, can you imagine, this is a revolutionary change because for thousands of years, they've never had an enemy. For the first time, they had an enemy. So they started to rethink that, but it took them a long time to get going. They had to unite their country. They had to restructure uh, the whole modernization program. They tried democracy, liberal capitalism. They tried communism. None of these things satisfied them. And it was all a mess until Deng Xiaoping's reforms but be began to converge all these new factors together. A mixture of capitalism, socialism, and a recognition of the new economic dynamism that global market economy represented. And they joined in. And they joined in to the extent of inviting themselves and it was invited and it was accepted by the WTO. The fact that they, they saw the changes in ASEAN one to ASEAN two was an opportunity for them to help them get into the, into the, as it were, the heart of the, this maritime trade, which became more and more vital to the economic development. By the, by the turn of the century, by the year 2000, it was very obvious that the Chinese economy was now dependent on maritime trade, not just helping them, but it was crucial to them. It was an existential problem that they should control their own, their own uh, seas for, to ensure that the maritime trade was protected. The serious consideration about naval power finally began to take shape because now they had the money to build the ships. I mean, prior to the 1990s, the Chinese were so poor, they didn't even have the resources to do that. But from the 1990s onwards, they were determined. And you can see what, what happens when the Chinese are determined to do something. They can be frighteningly efficient. And uh, within a few decades, People are talking about the Chinese Navy as if it was a, a major threat to world power and all that, which is to me actually absolute nonsense. 
the Chinese are building up a lot of ships and so on, but they still have not fought a naval war. They've never fought one. And as far as I can tell from Chinese history, they've never really won a serious naval battle in the whole of their history. So I, I would say, I'll put a push question mark there about China being a naval power. But nevertheless, they are trying. They're building it because they want to make sure that their coasts are safe, that China can never be threatened or invaded by sea again, and that their maritime routes for their trading needs and so on will be protected in, in, the, in, in the future. Now, these are their ambitions. If they have been more ambitions beyond that, one cannot be sure at this stage. Well, all I can say is at this stage, all they can hope for is to make sure that they are themselves totally defensible at sea and they had their economic dependence on maritime trade could not be threatened, blockaded, or totally contained by forces hostile to China's development. That's the Chinese approach. Now, now finally, to the new maritime, maritime route. I say it, we, we do recognize it's new because the old one was very different. The old one, as I said uh, earlier on, we recognized it was very peaceful. It didn't, didn't involve that many people because traveling by sea, long distance trade was still a pretty precarious business. And on the whole, the volumes were small, ships were small, ships were sunk, lost at sea, and was dangerous. And the numbers involved, uh, numbers of ships involved were relatively small by modern standards. The situation didn't really change until after the 18th century. And, partic and particularly once you talk about global market economy, once the Suez Canal shortened the route between the developed North, uh, North, Northwestern European uh, industrial economies and the Atlantic United States uh, economy, once you shorten that route into the Indian Ocean on one side and with the Americans on the other side with the Panama Canal and so on, open to the Pacific on the other side, when all these oceans are really open to global domination by a really powerful navy, the world really changed. That is globalization at, at reaching its, its heights, heights that never been achieved before. All those people talk about globalization before, before uh, modern times, but that's only by land and that's very limited. To, true, total, I mean, uh, genuine globalization could only be achieved if you control the seas. Then the whole globe, is, the whole world is under your control. And that started with the British, taken over the Americans. And now it is quite clear that the Americans and the British still recognize that this kind of maritime dominance is vital to their interests. This is what made them powerful, made them what they are, made them, in, put them in a position to telling the world how to be modern, how to, be, how to accept universal values that they had uh, de devised and worked out, and how to recognize that this is the way to go in the future. There is no other alternative but to go this way. And anybody trying to do it differently are getting it all wrong. And these are the messages that we have been getting, uh, I would say, since the end of the Second World War. And it was le led by the Americans, but never forget there was always the British naval power was always in the background, uh, something that the Americans inherited and made much stronger and much safer because the Americans, unlike the British, who were constrained by the fact that they were a little island off, the, off a continent, the Americans were their own continent. They had no enemies on their continent, no land enemies, nobody to threaten the United States itself so that they could concentrate almost all their resources on building a Navy that, a navy that can, control, can control the world. Control to, to begin with the two oceans, Pacific and Atlantic, and now of course the Indian Ocean very obviously uh, since the, uh, the war in the Middle East uh, in the last few years. This is global naval hegemony at its strongest, something that the British had dreamt of, but never quite had the power to achieve. The Americans have achieved it. Now this is the global maritime world dominated by the most powerful navies of the world. China wants to find a role in it. A maritime Silk Route is one of the ways of talking about it. But if you actually look closely at it, what's new about it was this new maritime route had to take into account that it was that route depended on other people's powers, the people who could actually control and police, as it were, this global maritime economy were not were not an international community. It was an Anglo-American naval hegemony. And that 
is the Chinese at least certainly identify that as something that is uh, very, very powerful, very difficult to, to, to deal with. And I think the wise leaders amongst them would never think of actually challenging that because that is really too, too, too tough, too tough. What the Chinese want to be sure of is that in their own neighborhood, in their own backyard, naval power, they must have enough naval power to ensure their safety. Because they still, after all, have continental problems. They have continental neighbors, 14 different neighbor, neighboring states on land, all have to be delicately handled, and some of them hostile. So they have enough problems of their own. Naval, naval uh, safety and naval influence and so on. It's only a, one part of what they need. I think the Chinese recognize that. You know, remember when they developed uh, at the end of the Cold War, the first, one of the first things they did is it very interesting to show that their, their full understanding of the continental needs was to set up the Shanghai Cooperation Council. And that recognized recognition that they got to safeguard their continental borders at the end of the Cold War was, to my mind, absolute classic response that the Chinese would have to their geo, geo, geopolitical, geostrategic uh, thinking. And that remains, I think, significant even to this day when you think about withdrawal from Afghanistan, the question of the future of Central Asia, the question of the Muslim states there, and the linkage with Iran and, and, and the Middle East between uh, across Central Asia. All these are very different from the, the, the kind of world that the Anglo-American naval hegemony can, can deal with. In fact, what the, uh, the global power the single superpower that emerged at the end of the Cold War that America became, America had hoped to be able to be much more influential on land, to find uh, to reduce the influence of Russia, if they can get into Middle East, total control of the Middle East situation. And in that way, one of the reasons why they took the, the very dangerous moves they made into the Middle East, uh, right across North Africa and Middle East, into as far as Afghanistan, uh, was not accidental. It was part of a general feeling that if you are the sole superpower in, 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 the, in the world, you must not just limit yourself to maritime interests, you must be involved in continental interests. But their adventure in the, on the continent has not succeeded. This is quite obvious. They're now even more dependent on their maritime supremacy. And I think this is what is very much on the minds of the uh, of the the, the the sole superpowers, remnant power, as it were, is now maritime. The continental side of it, I think they would have to concede that this is not, they're not something that they can easily control. China, on the other hand, has no choice. It has to be both a continental power as well as naval, with na adequate naval defense to look after their existential interests in their future economic development. So they are now caught in a very much more complex situation for the first time in history to be both involved in continental con matters as well as maritime con matters at the same time. And to find the right balance is what they talk about and they talk about the BRI, the Belt and Road in uh, Initiative. And when you look back on it, and this is of course, many, there are many experts on this, much more, much more knowledgeable than I am about the details of how all these different groups of activities and investment projects and, and so on into different parts of Asia, Africa, Latin America, how they all pull together into something under the umbrella of the BRI. This is a very recent thing in 2013 when Xi Jinping announced it, but actually this had been going on for at least a decade and a half before that when Chinese investments began to go out. Chinese entrepreneurs, some were private, some were semi-public, some were SOEs, were actually investing outside, particularly in areas where the Europeans and the Westerners were not interested in or didn't find it profitable or find it, uh, found it uh, diff too difficult. Areas where chances of making profit were very, uh, you know, very uncertain. Many of these Chinese uh, took great risks to venture into them. And all that had been going on through the first decade of the 21st century uh, without a name. It had different ventures and the government was aware of it, was aware that some of them were successful, some of them were failures. 
and encourage some and others, but in a very unfocused way. Xi Jinping only became interested in this, I think, when he became vice president and the heir apparent. And by the time he became leader, his advisors and others had helped him think through this to recognize that this all could be pulled together into some more state-focused or state-centered enterprise with some strategic meaning behind it. Up to that point, I think up to 2013, all those activities were done, you know, by sure in private, in a lot of initiatives by very venturesome and entrepreneurial Chinese. But from 2013 onwards, they were pulled together. And what is more, Xi Jinping decided to make it into a big thing to get everybody interested in it. Got the whole of every province in China had to have a BRI project and all, all that sort of thing. So you, all the build up was enormous. So it actually alarmed everybody. Suddenly, instead of being a lot of venturesome entrepreneurial Chinese trying to make money here and there, suddenly it became the Chinese Communist Party is behind the BRI. And, then, and, and, and this was a national project to, to help to dominate the world through economic uh, debt, uh, treat, uh, using debt to, to tie, tie in countries into China. And so became a very complicated and almost, you might say, a, a, a for alarming uh, strategy for dominating the world. I think all that is, uh, is really overstated. There may be a few odd people who thought uh, for that from time to time, and there may be some uh, nationalists in China who, who feel really proud that they're able to reach out so far. But frankly, if you take take the do the sums, and I believe uh, in Malaysia, you had experts have done it for Malaysia. Other countries have done it for Indonesia, for Thailand, for um, Pakistan, or other countries, and uh, in different parts of Africa. And I think on the whole, you find that the Chinese are not making money out of this. A lot of it, they're struggling and they're having great, great difficulty in keeping them going and to make sure that they don't lose. And in some cases, they may come out of it uh, better off. But in, in many cases, they're not at all certain. And this is by no means something that is straightforward. And then you contrast it. And now this is, I find, I'll end on this point, that when you talk about the new maritime Silk Route, you cannot separate it from the belt the, main, the continental belt route, which is to link up the overland ambitions of the traders overland. And that is not entirely a commercial enterprise. I think the maritime thing you could say is primarily initiated by commercial interest with some ge geostrategic elements drawn into it after it became an umbrella uh, affair by Xi Jinping. But the, 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 the continental part, the belt part of it, from the very beginning, way back from the Shanghai cooperation after the end of the Cold War onward, the recognition that they need somehow to develop their West, the relationships with all those states that were created out of the Soviet Union in Central Asia, the fact that they had this very special relationship with Pakistan because of India's, the war after the war with India, and is a very delicate and extremely, to my mind, uh, expensive, and very uncertain relationship. Nevertheless, they developed it. It is extremely close. And they now began to think differently. They found that it was not enough to have maritime interest because naval power was not in their hands. Naval power can block off and blockade and contain China to the south, in the South China Sea. And the Chinese can do very little about it, uh, frankly. So what they needed was extra access to the Indian Ocean. And this is where, of course, they're actually doing it by land, not by sea. They're doing it through Burma to, to Rakhine State, to Alakan, and they're doing it through Pakistan to reach the, uh, the Indian Ocean so that they can get at the oil of Iran in the Middle East. And they also, in other ways, uh, reaching out to the Mediterranean, as far as they can, I can see they're trying, they, they try, but all by land, land over to reach over to the, to the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And further north, all, entirely by land, all the way to EU, to Germany, to, to, to the North Sea, to, to, to the, the, the markets of, of the West. So they had, they had many features to this, and including 
even in our region in Southeast Asia, including the fact that the BRI includes completely land routes through Laos to Thailand, to Malaysia and Singapore, and then others into Myanmar, others into Laos, into Cambodia, which do not depend on the sea. So in a funny sort of way, the Chinese are not forgetting the fact that dependence on the sea is itself not safe. They have to have many ways to reach out to markets and resources, and they have to learn how to deal with the land differently from in the past, but they still have to learn how to do that and cannot put all the eggs in the maritime basket. So the new maritime sea route has also to be seen as part of that. Maybe even to the extent of saying they may hope to make some money, some profits out of the new maritime sea route to pay for the very expensive land routes, which are not going to make them money. I mean, to try and get through the uh, whole of Burma into, into Al Khan, to go and defend the routes to Pakistan from the Hindu Kush to the Indian Ocean, uh, that is not only expensive, but also very dangerous terrain. And I, I'm, the Chinese are realistic enough to know that's not going to be a profitable enterprise. That is, that is a strategic commitment to make themselves, give themselves access to the Indian Ocean should they ever be blocked uh, in, in, in the, in, by sea. I mean, again, these are long-term views. I do not know whether they pay off in the end. I'm not at all clear that it will be so, but you can see that a, a, a change in forces in Afghanistan could make a lot of people do a lot of thinking about how all this will add up to at, on the belt side. And this is not unrelated to the new maritime sea route. I think you have to take in, that into account. But whatever resources you have available to invest in the new maritime sea route has also got to be weighed against all the investments and costs and, and uh, resources put into making it feasible for the land route to be manageable, to be valuable to them. And I am far from clear that all this will add up with a plus side on the ledger, so to speak. I'm actually thinking that this new maritime sea route got to be placed very much in that context. So if I may conclude, this new maritime sea route not only have to face the fact that ASEAN is new and therefore what happens to ASEAN, how the other side looks at ASEAN matters tremendously to them. And you can see, of course, both China and let's say the rivalry between US and China, both sides would like ASEAN to lean to one side or the other. And ASEAN's best bet is to, to, to lean to neither. If they can stay that way, and if they stay that way and stay united, that would be ideal. But it's far from being a, a, a certainty. And both sides will continue to try to at least win some over to each other. So that would be one of the challenges that will persist. And that is a recognition that the Chinese have made. And, the, and of course, they know that the US have always been interested and because they created the Southeast Asia concept and ASEAN to, to begin with. So the Chinese are content if they can make sure that ASEAN remains autonomous and not lean to and not take sides. I think they will, con they will be content to see that as a measure of success. I think to the United States, that's not enough. But to I think to China, I think they will be content to, if they can keep it that way, that is progress because they were starting from the other side. As for the as for the uh, the maritime route itself, I would say that they would be very very lucky if they don't lose money there, and if the money they made there could in any way help towards the tremendous cost of maintaining the belt road to uh, in, in on the continent. I think I'll end on that. I mean, I've talked too long already. Thank you all very much for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wang, for that really, really uh, very, very broad sweep of uh, history uh, and, and into the uh, current period. Uh, uh, I, I didn't realize that you're actually going to talk very much about the, uh, the present moment. Uh, and, and I think this would uh, give us a lot of food for thought uh, in terms of how we, how we actually deal with the, the current situation. I, I'm brimming with all kinds of questions for you because uh, you touch on many of my favorite topic uh, subjects. Uh, you know the ASEAN, uh, 
you know, strategies vis-a-vis -vis the uh, superpowers and so on. Of course, the harks back to the Cold War and the post-Cold War situation and so on. Uh, I, th I think, uh, but but we have two discussions, so I, I won't uh, <laughs> I won't I won't sort of uh, raise my questions until perhaps to, uh, to the end or to, to, uh, to, during the Q and A period. Now we do have two discussions, distinguished discussions. Uh, discussions, uh, Professor Wong, uh, Professor Wong, Danny Wong, uh, whom I already introduced, and uh, Professor Abdul Rahman, uh, both Dato sorry, uh, neglected neglected to mention. Uh, but uh, can I just uh, invite both of you to speak, uh, you know, one after the other, and then we'll wait for the second session. That will be about 20 minutes or so. Uh, I, I, I will monitor your time. So over to you, uh, Professor Wong. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Johan. Uh, you can hear me well? Can, yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah, um, first of all, I'd like to express my thanks to the Academy uh, Professor Malaysia and also to the chairman, uh, the president, um, Professor uh, Dr. Sri uh, Daing, for having me for, to be a discussion to this very important talk uh, delivered by Prof. Wang. And also, I'm very happy to see so many friends on the on screen. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank Prof. Wang for giving us a very illuminating uh, talk on this maritime server, this new maritime server and the impact it has on uh, China and ASEAN. Um, I think um, Prof. Wang uh, reminded us that he started his uh, academic career, uh, at least when he started to focus, was, he was working on the Nanhai trade. And the Nanhai trade, of course, uh, dates from the Song Dynasty. And he re also reminded us that, uh, you know, the, since then, the Chinese began to slowly look into uh, the maritime side of the geography. So Prof Wang has traced the story of the maritime Silk Road uh, from the ancient time, uh, together with the, not forgetting the Ming Dynasty, the Ming voyages of uh, Amir Zhen He and so on. But he also reminded us that for many, many years, um, China has been mainly a land power and that it did not actually venture out until the Song Dynasty. And then later on during the Ming Dynasty, of course, uh, we were uh, reminded of the fact that uh, Admiral Zheng He and the uh, Ming voyages went all the way to the uh, South, uh, this, the African uh, continent. But of course, uh, we were, he, was, uh, he also reminded us that uh, they were not the same as the circumstances of the two maritime silk road, uh, very different. And the motivation behind them, the objectives behind them were also different. The ancient silk road, as we all remember, seems to have an imperial design uh, with the tributary uh, relations governing the order, the world order that China had with the rest of the world. And, um, the, also the many kingdoms that China were encountering at that time. Um, Zheng He uh, did not, uh, when he was dealing with uh, Sri Lanka, for instance, he did not have to face or contend with another uh, great sea power, like say Britain in the modern times or today, the United States. And neither did the Ming Chinese got to uh, contend with the West, uh, that uh, present day West that demanded adherence to international law, modern international law of the sea, etc., and uh, uh, the code of conduct uh, that you see uh, on, on the international scenes. But no matter how different this Silk Road, um, this old one vis-a-vis uh, -vis the new one, uh, I think it nonetheless, most of us would, the moment we think of the Silk Road, we always remember of the fact that uh, Zheng He uh, the American her came here and that Ming voyages was very much a part of our history. But uh, that was so many years ago and much has happened uh, during that 600 over years since the Ming voyages and internally uh, China, as Pro Wang has reminded us, has changed from the Ming dynasty to the Manchu dynasty and then uh, how during the Manchu dynasty, the second half, uh, China was humiliated when it uh, fought and lost the sea battles uh, against the, uh, uh, the West, uh, especially during the Opium War. 
But later on, towards the end of the 19th century, it also launched to, to Japan uh, in the, uh, the 1895 uh, war. And uh, later on, we could, we could see that China went into decline and it was humiliated all the time, almost until uh, you know, the Second World War. Uh, we saw eight years of terrible war and then subsequent change of government. Even after the change of government with the new uh, People's Republic of China, we saw that it took another 30 years uh, before it was able to get its um, act right uh, with the coming of uh, Deng Xiaoping. And when Deng Xiaoping introduced the modernization process uh, as well as the program for reform, then we could see that China was uh, rising again. But uh, so when we, what we see today is the fruits of that transformation that uh, process of, uh, of modernization that was started by Deng Xiaoping. But uh, so the new Silk Road that we see today is very much a part of that transforming China. But uh, Prof Wang also reminded us of the fact that much have actually taken place earlier, even before the introduction of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013. Uh, before that, they came out, the Chinese already uh, came out to Southeast Asia. I remember attending conferences on Maritime Silk Road those days. This was way before the introduction of the Belt and Road Initiative, which started, which gave a name to the uh, new Maritime Silk Road. So we could see that the idea was already there and that um, the, the Chinese were already coming up. And this new Maritime Silk Road, and Prof Wang did emphasize of the fact that this is new, um, the word new was launched after uh, 2013. It's the maritime side of the Belt and Road Initiative. It is uh, bringing to the world a new way of thinking, a new connectivity, and also a new common destiny as what the Chinese uh, would like to say. Uh, we have a scale that was unprecedented. So if you remember that, uh, you know, Zheng He, Emperor Zheng He in the 15th century, he went all the way to uh, the eastern shore of uh, South of Africa. But the new Maritime Silk Road went beyond that. And together with the land belt, the belt side of the, the, the land side of the, um, the Belt and Road Initiative, we could see that it, is, it has reached, on, reached out to all the way to Europe as well. And more importantly, uh, this is a new initiative that is giving, uh, provides new methods, new solution and to, to new uh, connectivity as well as perhaps even wealth creation. But of course, um, Prof Wang reminded us that it cost, actually cost the Chinese a great deal to maintain this program. So the question now is that um, the Prof Wang also mentioned about the fact that uh, this actually eventually brought the Chinese to a realignment of the strategic alignment in terms vis-a-vis -vis the sea. So this is where the building of the new Navy and, this, uh, and how China with this new Navy and also with its, uh, with its trajectory of uh, power has been perceived to be a threat perhaps to many countries in the region as well as to others containing powers as well. So the question would be, what about ASEAN countries? Uh, Prof Wang reminded us that despite the attractiveness of the new maritime syrup, there are concerns uh, among the ASEAN countries. So the question, for instance, uh, that comes to mind would be, can ASEAN, ASEAN continue to work as a bloc or would it be split, opinion split by uh, the new, new maritime syrup? Road? We have seen that happen in a lot of places. The rise of China also uh, state opinion. Some people say that's a good thing, but others may think that it is not, uh, it is a threat, for instance. They are also concerned about the South China Sea. Um, so we have a lot of countries in the region, Malaysia included, uh, to, uh, to be one of those overlapping claimants. So, and in fact, one of the claimants, Philippines, actually brought the Chinese to the Court of uh, International Court of Justice in 2016 and won the case. So, Maritime Silk Road 
this new maritime silk road seems to be giving a lot of meanings, but it also brought along a lot of issues as well. I would like to just pose two questions, perhaps to Prof Wang, uh, to enlighten us further. I think Prof Wang um, talked quite a lot about how uh, China and ASEAN, how this maritime silk road, um, you know, govern, may govern or may actually affect um, the relations between um, China and ASEAN. The question that I would like to pose is that how is it, how Marit the Maritime Silk Road is going to change uh, our world, uh, especially ASEAN? Is it going to change us? Um, is it going to actually impact us? Or is it going to split us in any way? So that is my first question. And in my second question is a bit more specific, much more to the more recent events. So we brought Wang towards the end of, the, of his lecture also mentioned about this, about US-China rivalry. The ongoing discussion uh, that, uh, that we see is that uh, the question that came out has always been whether ASEAN countries will need to, to take side. I think Prof Wang alluded a bit to this, but perhaps uh, he can actually uh, enlighten us further on this question. Because um, especially now that the, there is a new alliance that came out, the um, new strategic alliance, the uh, Ox, Ox, uh, the AUKUS um, strategic alliance uh, that was formed this year uh, to with a specific goal of or aim of countering China that was spelled out uh, you know, in the document. So the question is that um, when come to this, does um, ASEAN need to make a choice? Countries in ASEAN have to make a choice. <laughs> so perhaps I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you, thank you, Danny. Uh, uh, now can I invite uh, Prof uh, Ramanambong? Uh, thank you. Remarks. Uh, thank you, Professor Johan, moderator. And a very good morning to Professor Wang Tang Wu. It's really very nice to meet you again, Prof, though only virtually. And it's very nice to see you fit and healthy. And a belated birthday to you. Yeah. Birthday. And uh, may you have more happy birthdays in the future. Um, I really feel very humble, honored, and privileged to be a discussant. For your lecture. I, I feel that uh, your lecture is so encyclopedic, uh, so, so <clears throat> vast in covering such uh, almost uh, Asia, the European history, Asian history, the Southeast Asia, uh, <clears throat> and also uh, the present developments. And it's really very difficult to make a commentary on it. And uh, Prof. Danny has Make his comments, but nevertheless, I will, for the purpose of extending the discourse, I will try to make uh, a few points and uh, post to you uh, these points and see what your reflections on them are. I mean, you made a fantastic tour de force to explain how historians have been having a big problem in their hand to name the region. What is the name of the region in Southeast Asia because of its heterogeneity? The mainland is different. The archipelagic region is different, and that um, and that they couldn't name it for so, so long. And even later on, when the name Southeast Asia came, uh, and you said it, it was the, the Japanese who, who saw there's some kind of unity in the region, and then later on, America created the Southeast Asian Command, but. Scholars at that time uh, and even later regarded Southeast Asia as very contingent, very contingent. But I'm happy to hear later on that uh, that when you talk about ASEAN, uh, you talk about the original ASEAN file, which was part of the Cold War um, the Cold War outfit. But later on, when ASEAN became ASEAN ten, and then that you see, you see that as the real ASEAN having its own autonomy, has, has got its own agency, and can decide uh, its own policies regarding what to do um, uh, among, its, among itself and also in dealing with many powers. However, I just would like to, um, on this question of the region, the naming of the region, 
uh, I suppose in history, there is this name called the Gordon Cusones. I think it was Paul Whitley who mentioned that. And that is regarded as also the land of the spices. And if I'm not mistaken, China regarded this region as Nanyang, that means South Seas. Uh, but whether that name really stick or not, I'm, I'm not very sure. Very, very sure. Um, but uh, the, the point is that uh, the, the, that giving the name to the religion seemed to be coming from outside and outside forces, outside powers. But I'm curious, uh, I just would like to, to, to uh, probe you a bit here, that there were also attempts within the region to give a name for the region. Of course, we have the names like Malacca Sultanate, we have the names like Srivijaya, uh, Majapahit, uh, and, and various other names. But I think a more, what, you, what we call that a bigger name was trying to unify at least parts of the region was Nusantara. That Sumpah Pate uh, Gajah Mada in the 1340s was that he said he will not rest until he was able to unite the whole of Nusantara. So I think uh, it is important also for those who try to create, who, who discuss the name of the region to take into account the, the, the attempts within the region itself to give a name to itself, though not uh, inclusive or, of all of Southeast Asia, but at least part of Southeast Asia was given that name, uh, Nusantara. And then in 1988, if I'm not mistaken, when Professor Sultan Takde Ali Shahbana was given an honor in USM, University of Science Malaysia, and he gave his lecture there, he tried to create a new name called Bumantara. But, uh, <laughs> but it did not catch up. The name did not uh, find resonance among scholars, so I suppose it's only part of history rather than. But Nusantara is a name that resonates until today, politically, culturally, uh, even economically. I mean, many people have used uh, the name Nusantara for different purposes. And uh, I just want to just quickly uh, mention about what we did at IQAS a few years ago. We had a project under Professor Hans Data Evers, who was the chair, the, the uh, Port of Yacht chair at the time. The theme of the project was connecting oceans. And we published two books based on the project. One was Malaysia as a maritime nation. And the second one was Malaysia as a Nusantara civilization. So, so it's, it's trying to look from inside, whilst of course taking into account how the region was defined by, from outside, and that trying to look at historical antecedents uh, and how these historical antecedents can be made to serve the present and the future. That's my first point uh, about the name. Um, to, but, but now I think it's, it's good that the, what do you call it, there is a name to the region with an identity called ASEAN, which has got its own agency, its own autonomy, and can uh, uh, <clears throat> define its own policies. My second point is about China. I think there is uh, a various perceptions about China. Historically, I mean, China, as you rightly pointed out, and powerfully too, was a land-based power. That its problem was from the north. And it had to address uh, the challenges from the north. It, it got a great wall which was also uh, its defense against the, the, the invading uh, barbarian, so-called, etc., etc. And, and that, uh, but there was this voyages by Admiral Chen He. And it is interesting that the, the maritime voyages by Chen He was not really given that much emphasis by the emperor and that the eighth voyage was canceled. But, um, um, and, and the point you made that there were there are no enemies there were no enemies to the south in the, from the sea uh, that, that is an interesting point so why waste our resources in the sending more voyages to the south but the, the point uh, I just would like to make here is that the voyages left a deep impression upon the region especially Malaysia especially Malacca I mean the I mean, the, of course, as you, as you know, I mean, the, 
much has been made of the relationships with China, of Otri Hang Lipo, of the legacy, Chinese legacy in Malacca, uh, and even there is, uh, I will recall that uh, the museum, Hang Lip, uh, sorry, uh, and Chengha Museum in, in Malacca and all that. So, but I suppose this history may be mixed with romance and facts, but nevertheless, it remains as historical memories. And historical memories are powerful. And I think China, especially Xi Jinping, saw that. And when he came to Southeast Asia and spoke at the Indonesian parliament uh, on in 20, 2013, in November 2013, and invoked history of the Maritime, the old Maritime Silk Road, it really touched something. It touched the nostalgia and the so called romance of the region in the past and how history can be made to serve the present and to build the future for some kind of shared prosperity. So, so I just uh, would like to hear you on this further, whether how much of the maritime, the old maritime sea road, what is in, written in books and articles and all that has been a compilation of real history or was it really a fact? Because but from what you said, the facts of the case was that the, classic, the maritime sea road was not given that much emphasis by China at that time, but the overland silk road was because of, of the geography and the, the strategy of the region and all that. <clears throat> uh, that is my, my second point. The third point is that you said China was not a naval power. Yes, it is true. Though perceptions may think that China is a naval power, uh, but, but China is now building itself, building a naval power in the 20th century. And there is this talk about the BRI as an example of the return of oriental globalization. Uh, you made a point, important point, that actually you cannot really globalize through land routes because of the terrain, the difficulties of connectivity and all that. But you can, you can go further if you go to the sea. Um, <clears throat> the point here is this, that uh, um, that though China is not a maritime power yet, it is trying to be so, but the perceptions is that uh, China is, especially China's uh, activities in the South China Sea, the redrawing of the region, the nine dash line, and some, re some parts of the South China Sea waters, 2000 kilometers away from the China shores as defined as China territory. I think, and then some intrusions into the waters of such littoral Southeast Asian countries, including Malaysia, like the, the Bating Patingi Ali uh, in the, of the coast of Sarawak in 2017. Uh, this create concern, creates concern among uh, members of ASEAN. And the point is this, that when there are negotiations on this, uh, on this issue, China, it, would like to see it as a bilateral negotiation, not as a collective or multilateral negotiation between ASEAN and China. So, so whilst on the one hand, China recognizes the importance of ASEAN, its autonomy, its agency, et cetera, et cetera. But when dealing with issues like this, ASEAN countries are too small to engage effectively with China on this issue. And only if the countries act as a collective, multilateral as ASEAN, then perhaps some of the issues in the South China Sea can be addressed more effectively. I mean, sharing, I mean, the spirit of the Maritime Sea Road is shared prosperity, friendship, peace, and uh, shared prosperity. And, 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 and that has got to be shown in practice, that friendship, uh, peace, and, and, and so on and so forth. I remember reading a statement by the China's ambassador, His Excellency Ouyang Chi Sing, uh, sometime this year, that uh, the South China Sea is a sea of friendship, peace, and cooperation. I think that is a good signal that uh, he's sending uh, to ASEAN, uh, to Malaysia, and the others. And that I think that should be the spirit uh, uh, that guide, should guide the, uh, the discussion on the South China Sea and perhaps uh, the code of conduct uh, which is now being 
perhaps finalized or to be to be one for that uh, to be signed next year between ASEAN and China will perhaps uh, be a, a framework for the resolution of the problem. I think that that is an agenda on both sides, China as well as ASEAN, to resolve the problem of the South China Sea. And just now, Professor Danny raised about the stuff, the geopolitics political issue that South China Sea has now become more and more become more and more what you call that and and involved in geopolitical rivalries. Uh, China on the one hand, then the U.S. Uh, the Quad and the Aukus now are coming, and this makes ASEAN puts ASEAN in a very difficult position. And of course, uh, you have pointed out earlier that ASEAN has come of age, and ASEAN is guided by the zone of peace, neutrality, freedom, and neutrality ZOFAN that was uh, declared in November 1971. And of course, the ASEAN Vision 2025, which also emphasizes on active neutrality. So, so as, but nevertheless, ASEAN is, as the Malays say, can, what they call the two, the two elephants fight. Dua gajah bertarung. in the tengah-tengah ASEAN, in a way, though ASEAN in terms of population is 600,000, 600 million plus, but ASEAN is 10 countries, not one. But China is one country. America is one country. And these alliances are fairly powerful states. So I think that that is a concern uh, uh, in, in the region that ASEAN should not be put in a situation where the two big elephants uh, quarrel and uh, make, create a tense situation uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, especially in the South China Sea. My last point, uh, Prof. Johan, how, uh, how many more minutes do I have? Uh, about one minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. My last comment is about BRI, Belt oh, yeah. and Road Initiative. Um, uh, well, BRI, you said, is not really making money. It's more strategic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it puzzles me why China has has extended the BRI to 140 countries, to include parts of uh, South America. Uh, and by 2019, I think 140 countries have more or less signed an MOU with China to be particip participant of BRI. Now, but for ASEAN, I think BRI is seen as uh, what they call it a blessing. It, in a way, in, term, in the sense that it provides infrastructure and connectivity uh, given the development of gaps in ASEAN. That's it. But there is a worry about BRI too, especially the loans. The loans, uh, I mean, there is a that that track there. Malaysia, the East Coast Railway line has got a problem. Africa, some states in Africa and the South Asia also have that perception. So, so I think China is aware of this, and it has got to correct this this perception of of uh, its projects uh, creating difficulties for the participating countries, and. Um, and I hope this, this is um, something that we can address in the future. Your, your comments, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for your two discussions. Uh, Prof. Wang, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> Danny had two questions. I believe I don't have to repeat them, I believe. Eh? I think you got them. Uh, and do, uh, and Raman has three. <laughs> I do my best. There are a lot of questions out there. I'm not sure I can answer all of them. But let me, let me uh, try and cover some of them in this way. I think it's, uh, it is one of the common concerns with both discussions is the question of ASEAN unity. And from the very beginning, I told, as I said, the fact that it didn't have a name for itself uh, under, uh, under, underlines its, uh, its, its weakness. Because it's, in other words, it's, it, is not, it doesn't naturally feel one. It's always partial. Even Nusantara, I agree, it's a lovely name and I use it often. But it, 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 we, everybody knows it only covers archipelagic uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and it doesn't. It never meant to cover uh, the, the, the mainland, and it, it has a ring about it. And uh, yes, fine. But the golden cousin is only used by the Greeks. Nobody else uses it. Uh, I know, <laughs> I know, Witty quoted that, but nobody uses that. Uh, Savanna Bhumi and all used by the Indians and uh, Buddhists, but uh, again. Everybody's got a little bit of a name, but you, you find that almost all those names are partial. It's only about a part that they're interested in or they knew something about. But the self-identity of the whole thing never, never, 
never happened. So I think the ASEAN cannot totally forget the fact that this, this is why it is an endangered, it is an endangered species in that sense that uh, it has no natural thing to fall back on. It has always been something created for a particular purpose at the time, but now it has gained its own identities, gained its own confidence. It can play a role, but it, it cannot afford to forget that it has fundamental weaknesses. And that is something I think uh, people are aware of. And of course, that makes the ASEAN as a group have to work so much harder to make sure that they do work together. They do understand that they must hang together if they don't want to hang separately as it were. So this takes the second point, your, your uh, uh, Ramambo's point about, about, about splitting. Again, given that weakness, it is relatively easy to split a region that has no natural deep roots in the soil. So it is natural. So again, it, it, we're talking about a modern mind thinking in modern strategic terms about the future survival of small states in between great powers. And that is always a problem. I mean, it's, this is not a peculiar to, to Southeast Asia, but in Southeast Asia, it has a particular uh, opportunity threat kind of alternative. It is both an opportunity and all a constant threat to its survival. So it has to be continually alert, continually stretch away as it were, to make sure that it doesn't lose that lose sight of its of its uh, of, of its destiny, and some of the other questions do link up in the end with U.S.-China relations because they all they all related in some way. Because when we talk about now, we talk about the two elephants in the room. Um, in the eyes of China, particularly, I would say that what has been trying to create the, the image has been trying to create is of a tiger in the garden. In your, back, in your backyard, as it were, that China is a big tiger in the backyard of Southeast Asia. If you focus it on China and ASEAN, then China is the tiger in the backyard. But to the Chinese, when they take more global, global pictures, if you take the overall uh, power structure of the world, then the elephant in the room is not China. The elephant in the room is Anglo-American naval hegemony. That's the elephant in the room, because no matter what we say, Southeast Asia, is in between two oceans. And to, to Southeast Asia, what is always hanging over Southeast Asia is naval hegemony. Because it's not, it's not continental power that worries Southeast Asia so much. It, of course, there's a, there are quarrels over Mekong and the borders between uh, Burma and China and Vietnam is problem. But that's not the real threat to ASEAN. The real threat to ASEAN or, and, the, and the agency of ASEAN also depends, both the plus and minus side of ASEAN's future is actually hinged on the, its position between the two oceans, the Indian and Pacific Ocean. And therefore, naval hegemony is the key to ASEAN's future. So that extent, we cannot, we cannot escape from our geography and our history as well, because the history of the last couple of hundred years is that in fact, the naval dominance of one power and now a combination of, in fact, it's still one power, it's US power backed by Britain and Australia just playing a small role in, in that, and AUKUS and so on. It's, it's, uh, and the elephant in the room is this hegemony, naval hegemony. And I think it is in that context, and you start seeing what the Chinese do. The Chinese don't do it very well. They're extremely clumsy in my view in some of the things they say. And they are, they are quite um, innocent about international law, for example. Uh, in fact, they basically don't understand to, to my mind how international law is being used for political purposes and they don't know how to use, how to answer back. And when they try to do that, it, it sounds unconvincing. For example, how do you draw borders at, at, on the sea? It's, it's, uh, it's something never been done before. I mean, the Chinese are pretty good at drawing borders on land. They've done borders on land with everybody. They still quarrel with India a little bit, but you see all the others, they've actually resolved it. Drawing a line on the land is so much easier. You can put a fence up and so on and so forth. But how do you do it at sea? But if you don't, if you don't uh, think hard about it and use the same logic to apply to the sea, you're asking for trouble. And I'm, I'm not sure that they are sufficiently aware and sensitive to the difference. Nobody knows how to draw lines on the sea and therefore it needs a different kind of approach, different kind of mentality. 
But when you talk about lines on a sea, when it broken lines and so on, um, it's, it just sounds wrong. And it's not convincing. And no matter how you explain it, they say there's history and so on. For, it, it doesn't sound right. But mind you, it doesn't sound right even for some of the claimants in the South. All of them are new lines. They're all drawn up in the more recent times. And nobody knows how to draw this. And everybody who tries to draw a line on the sea is actually creating the same problem. So it's not only China in that way. Once you start saying, this is the line on the sea, and, and, and everybody's doing that in, that in South China, in the South China Sea, partly in response to China, but partly because that, that's, they, they don't actually know, you know what did this international law mean in, when you start talk, drawing borders and talk about sovereignty at sea. Uh, Uncle spent many years trying to resolve this. And in the end, uh, when they drew up a document, the Chinese were really new at the time, newly joined the United Nations. They quite innocently thought they could get around it by saying it doesn't cover sovereignty and thought they could get away from the problem. But actually the Americans understood it very much better than the Chinese. So the, to this day, the Americans have not ratified UNCLOS because they knew that some bits of UNCLOS would not actually be uh, in the interest of the United States. Whereas the Chinese were innocent enough to sign it and then find that in the end, this sovereignty argument doesn't protect them from, from arguments and, and, and quarrels at sea. And, and so I, I would say this is something that requires rethinking, a lot of readjustment, because international law is not at all clear. I'm taught, I've listened to a lot of international lawyers on this, and they do try to, they try to build on the idea that once there is a law, you must, you must accept it. Now that I agree in principle. If both sides, everybody agrees, this is what the law means, and that is quite correct. But when that law itself is not clear between the people who are negotiating and they're arguing about the meaning of the law and the application of the law, then law doesn't actually in itself help. The law becomes actually a, 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 itself a, a, content, a contention issue, contentious issue. And so I think that has added to the South China problem. Your point about bilateralism is particularly interesting. You see, almost by definition, the word sovereignty, once you introduce the word sovereignty, sovereignty has always been working out the borders between two countries. Uh, the, you, you don't talk about sovereignty between regions because that's, that's not how the word operates. Sovereignty is about the sovereignty of each nation. So the trouble is that once you concentrate on the word sovereignty and think that sovereignty is the key in international law, that's how you protect your, your, your position in international law, then almost by definition, it's, it's bilateral because that's what sovereign, sovereignty arguments are about. Two countries got to agree about their borders. But the, 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 so all these things have been mixed up. And I would say that all of us in Asia have been learning about international law only in very recent times. International law did not really come into being until about the beginning of the 19th century. Maybe a little bit started earlier, but it really, from the beginning of the 19th century, that the European empires, the menu, you can see this, the international law was actually determined by the empires, the powerful empires of the day, after the Congress of Vienna, particularly of the British and the French empire, and then later on joined with the Americans and, and others, began to try and work out what international law means, how to operate relationship between empires so that they don't fight each other, to minimize the fight between each other, to minimize fighting one another so that they can concentrate on fighting somebody else, I guess. So that, that's how you work out this, it's a gradually step by step, to minimize the conflict that arise between powerful, each power trying to gain more power, bound to be conflict. So you work out international law to minimize the conflict. It makes very good sense when everybody's expanding and pushing in all directions. But that was how it started, to minimize conflict. And, and, what, and what it was, it was actually defined as the agreements, legal agreements between empires, between powerful nations to avoid war and only can be only understood by those civilized nations. You remember the early beginnings of international law did not apply to most of Asia, Asia and Africa. It didn't even apply to the Ottoman Empire or, the, or certainly not to the Mughal Empire or the Chinese Empire. It only applied really to European powers. And it was even up to the 19, end of the 90s, up to the 20th century, there were still concerns about how can you have real agreement between non-Christian countries? I mean, it's been the Christian, civilized Christian countries were the people who understood 
the natural law as the foundation of international law and so on. There were certain assumptions made so that in the League of Nations, you find if you read it carefully, you find how the Japanese felt. The Japanese worked very hard to be equal to the Europeans and the Europeans, after they defeated the Russians in the Russo-Japanese war, were given a kind of seat as an equal power. But when it came to the League of Nations, many issues determining the end of the First World War, the Japanese were treated as different. When the Japanese tried to uh, have some say in the, how, the, how the spoils were di divided as it were, they were treated as different and they, had, they were humiliated several times. And, and it, because on the grounds that there were always some argument that the Japanese didn't quite fit in because some of their assumptions about law and agreements don't match those of the, the powers that have determined the nature of international law. So if you really look back on it for us, who have come, come from small countries. Small countries have benefited from the fact that the idea of all nations being equal gives the small countries some protection. But we all know, but that is not true. Not all countries are equal. It cannot be. Some countries are so big and some are so small. The kind of equality is just imagined and we can, you can use it as a kind of imagined thing. And we, it's useful to, to say the law protects you. But in, in effect, the only protection is you can gang up together a large enough of Afro-Asian states or developing states, neutralist states, you form all kinds of things to defend yourself against the big powers because your small countries, each in itself has no way of dealing with it. So you can see international law functions in a very vague sort of way. And most of the new nations after 1945 uh, have been learning how to live in this international law world. But those people who had established international law have learned how to know how to use it and of course define the law in certain ways. I'm not challenging the legal aspects of it. I'm challenging the underlying assumption of it is that they had the, they had the philosophical background, the, the kind of civilization. Uh, and to be honest, it was devised in terms of Christian civilization to devise the terms by which civilized nations behave towards one another. And having devised that, they say, all of you must behave in the same way or you're not observing the spirit of international law and so on. So there are all sorts of underlying problems in the way international law is being used. So if you use it in a total legalistic way, those who have not been part, not participant in the original creation of this international law feel a little insecure. I'm not saying that the Chinese are right or wrong because it's not only China. Many, many countries have problems with international law. You can see all the disputes that go into WTO or, or all the international organizations you can think of. Most of the time, because the people don't quite understand the, the, the limits and the conditions under which these laws are drawn up and, and very often mi misread the, the whole thing. And then when they come, come against it as a problem, they don't know how to handle it, except, except in the end, get in some international lawyers who themselves don't always agree on, on how to interpret. So I'm, I'm really just setting the scene not to, not to dispute the importance of having international law, if we can all agree and start afresh from working out underlying principles of what this, what this system really should, how it should operate to really ensure what it's, it's supposed to mean that all countries are equal in the law, in the eyes of international law, something which I, I as a historian, find almost impossible to believe. So I'm sorry, I leave it at that because there's so many other issues, but I better stop. Thank you, Johan, for giving me a chance to answer. No, no, not at all. Yeah, no, uh, there are so many questions I am trying to read uh, from the audience, but there was one that uh, Danny asked you directly about, but you haven't sort of answered it. What do you think of the new alliance or the new uh, agreement on AUKUS? Oh, that one is still true. Yeah, the Australia, UK, and yeah, US. Definitely. You can take you can take it at the surface level. At the surface level is uh, simply that the it's the most comfortable to for the English speaking world for Australia, United Kingdom, and US to come together. They don't take it doesn't take much to for them to get together. They've been together fighting all the wars, never stopped since 1945. In fact, you go back to the First World War, to the old Boer War, they've, they've always more or less been on the same side. So that's the easiest one. It's a kind of line of least resistance. So that that's one part, the superficial part. The underlying part is it can be evaluated differently. You can say on the one hand, it is in addition to the Quad, so that it can extra, so extra uh, allies, extra support against China or whatever. You can look at it that way. Or you can even interpret as some people have done, 
to say that this is a, an extra defense that America has because they don't fully trust the effectiveness of the Quad. Because the Quad involves both Japan and Australia uh, and India who don't quite think like the Americans do. Whereas Britain and Australia clearly do. That they have, I think they have no, I mean, I don't see any reason why Britain and Australia today will ever disagree with the United States, for example. So it makes it very comfortable. Mm. It's such an easy thing to put together, so to speak. Yeah. But you can also say this is so slight, like, in addition to the quad, because the quad is not good enough. The quad is not, cannot be relied on at the, at the you know, at the, when it's really tested, not sure what India would do and how much to rely on Japan. There may be some doubts in people's mind, but no doubt about AUKUS. Those three countries, oh. you can take it, they will always, you know, it's a breeze alike, things alike, and, and therefore the easiest way to handle something like that. So, I mean, it's, it's too early to say, but I'm just right. putting forward some of the views expressed. So, so, so if I can just tag on, yeah, using my privilege as, as the moderator to that question, uh, you know, is, isn't, aren't all these alliances on the US and the, and the Western side uh, uh, based on the assumption that we have uh, expansionist China, we have a China that is interested uh, in, in, you know, not just soft power, uh, you know, just being attractive in terms of its uh, history, its culture, or even its trade. But there is a there is a China that is Ill interested in a military, you know, project. Uh, which uh, would would you be able to throw light on that? Is that is that is that correct? Well, let me say at the beginning, straight off, that I don't know how the Chinese leaders actually think. But if I draw upon Chinese history, I don't see any early examples of the Chinese yeah. wanting to dominate the world or run the world. And I think they're not that stupid to think that they can do that. I mean, they've seen the America try to run the world and what a pain that has been and what a, what a, at what cost and, and what benefits did they really get out of it. But what the Americans have succeeded, which they, they had it from the very beginning and they've never really added to it, and his naval power. As I mentioned earlier on, the naval hegemony of the 200, last 200 years, that has been assured and that is still being assured. And that has not changed. But the point is that when they want to go beyond that to control the world, uh, they, it's been absolute collapse, it's a failure. And the Chinese don't, don't, are not in a position of naval hegemony. That's, that's no way, no way like what the Chinese can do. Their continental powers are enormous. They have tremendous difficulties on their continent. And, and to that extent, they are still faced with the old problems of, uh, of the Eurasian continent and to be half continental and half, half of maritime. They are very lucky just to keep themselves secure, safe and defensible against all enemies. So nobody dares to fight them. Nobody can fight against them and they can protect their interests concerned. So I don't know how they actually think, but I think the historical examples yeah. and the actual real geopolitical and geostrategic facts make it very clear that the Chinese cannot hope to be global and will not be stupid enough to think they can. So that's my first assumption. The second assumption is this, that for, on the other hand, for the naval hegemonic, hegemonic forces, they, they don't want to see China preventing them from being absolutely in charge in the Pacific, for example. Not only South China Sea, but East China Sea and Indian. They don't want to see any kind of rivalry in that part of the world. I think that's understandable because they've been number one for so long and they are so powerful, they would like to stay that way. So what they, I think what is their interest to portray China as being potentially dangerous to everybody because they're globally ambitious and so on, so that they can rouse out the others to support this naval hegemony against China and demonize China to the effect that it makes it very easy to make everybody fear China, everybody getting an alarm, everybody want to get together and join the Americans and ask the Americans to save them from China. That would be ideal position for the, some of the strategists, I think, who think on behalf of, of America. Ideally, if everybody came around and told the Americans, please save us from China, that is the, the world that they would love best. But I think it's not believable. It's actually not credible. And I think the Chinese surely are wise enough not to try and put themselves in that position to be guilty of something as stupid as that. And then um, I think Prof. Rahman had the sort of uh, idea of the Nanyang and, and the, 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 the South China Sea question uh, and the nine dash lines. There's also something that I write about. 
uh, because uh, pe people are, are rather nervous or Southeast Asian countries are rather nervous about the, you know, building up of facilities, uh, landing strips, uh, military, you know, installations and so on, on these little, uh, little atolls and islands and so on. You don't think that is an ambition of, on the part of China to dominate well, I, the South China Sea? Uh, uh, let me say again, I don't know what is the thinking behind these PLA guys, but let me put it this way. I think the, what, what they are, they're not afraid of any of the countries in Southeast Asia. They're building those things because of the elephant in the room. I mean, I keep saying the yeah. elephant in the room has all the, US. the naval hegemony. And what they are really saying is that they don't want South China Sea to be seen as a part of an American sea. And, and this, in that sense, from their point of view, they, they think of it as defensive to make sure that there will never be, none of those areas could be used as bases for attacking China. Not, not that I'm saying the Americans plan to attack China, but this is China's fears that once they had been attacked and successfully attacked by the British in the 19th century mm -hmm. from the sea, it could happen again. And they want to make sure forever and ever, they could never be successfully attacked from the sea again. And who are capable of attacking them from the sea? The only power capable of doing that are the aircraft carriers off the coast of China. Yeah. So th that is the, the background in which the Chinese would say the elephant in the room makes us do certain things which unfortunately alarm the smaller countries, but they're not aimed at the smaller countries. That, that I think is probably genuine. They don't need to, they don't need to fill up those islands to deal with Vietnam or Philippines or Malaysia. They don't need to do that. But if it comes to American naval power in South China Sea, it's, it's, it's complete. I mean, the Americans in Rome, anywhere around there, at least in the eyes of the Chinese, and they're not, not comfortable with that because that means that at any time they can threaten China. And that's, I think, the underlying, as I, as the logic that I can see behind their thinking. Some questions from the audience. Uh, there's somebody who wants to know, uh, Prof. Wang, about the Tianxia system. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, is this a form of Chinese exceptionalism? Well, in so far as the Tianxia, the term was invented by the Chinese and nobody else uses it, that's exceptional to the Chinese, but what does it mean? I mean, it was invented a long, long time ago just to show that the emperor was uh, the son of heaven. And, uh, and that his rule, his illegitimacy came from the fact that the emperor has blessed him because that is why he won on the battlefield because the Chinese, the Chinese legitimacy is not based on like the Japanese emperor, which is based on heritage, inheritance. I mean, the Japanese are very proud and rightly so that their emperor is one, one distinct line, royal line from uh, 2000 years and so on. Whereas the, the Chinese one, they change every now and then by who wins on the battlefield. And, uh, and winning on the battlefield need not be even by Chinese. You lose out to the Xian Bei, to the Turks, to the Mongols, to the Manchus. And they rule all, all Mongols rule over all of China. So did the Manchus for 250 mm -hmm. years. So, that, and, and they were Tianxia. So the, it was a Manchu Tianxia. Uh, whoever ruled over China, uh, there was, they, he was the son of heaven. And they, they called themselves that, you know, they, they, they're not shy. Uh, they actually called themselves Tianzi, and therefore Tianxia in that sense. So the fact they invented the term and they're the only ones who use it makes it exceptional to China, but it doesn't apply to anybody else. I think you have answered most of the questions because uh, there's another one here about China. Uh, you know, it's BRI. Uh, let me just read it and maybe let's see. As the BRI is an ambitious plan to create two new trade routes connecting China with the rest of the globe for its economic purpose. At the same time, the BRI would help China to avoid maximum usage of the sea route. As China sought to prevent sea threats from the Western naval forces as per history, which posed threats to that nation, both economically and sovereignty, why isn't China working on his navy as well to prevent long-term maritime threats. I think my my uh, my answer would be what I've said earlier on that the Chinese know they can never really challenge naval hegemony of United States and its allies, or the naval allies. I mean, the United States alone is powerful enough, but the, plus its allies, the Chinese have no way they can ever match it in terms of naval hegemony. So the only way they can actually reach out to the world, to markets and to resources is economically, through trade, to connectivity via 
uh, mercantile, mercantile shipping and so on, and how to protect those mercantile shipping, how to link up this connectivity means they must have access to, uh, so that they can buy uh, and sell uh, mm. all over the place. I mean, they get the oil from Angola or Nigeria and get to markets in Europe where they really sell a lot and if it markets in America, if the Americans will allow them, uh, they would love, love to sell them to all. And re resources in Latin America, Australia, they were very, very happy with Australia until they found that Australia was so loyal to the, uh, to the, uh, to the rivals that they no longer trusted the Australians. But this is a special case. But for the rest, uh, access to markets and access to resources, as I put it, is now existential problem for the Chinese because their whole economic development of the last 40 years would have been impossible if they didn't have that access to the sea. Yes. And before this, the Americans had allowed them that access because the Americans wanted to make them into capitalists so that they'll become like America, but that is not gonna happen. So then the Americans have said, well, then why the hell did we allow you to get this far? We must now stop you or contain you so that you can't get any further. That's from the American point of view, understandable because from their interest point of view, but from the Chinese point of view, they're not going to directly confront or challenge Americans because they can't, in my, in my view. But they, what they can do is to extend their trading link trading. and connectivity to at least to enable their economic development mm -hmm. to proceed. Globalization that has been achieved so far is actually in the interest of the Chinese. It is, no, it is not accidental that Xi Jinping cont continually talks about globalization. He's, it is not his interest to encourage people to be patriotic. I mean, no, it could be, uh, but, uh, 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 to be narrow, narrowly protectionist. They, it's completely against their interest. They want to be open up. And BRI is an, a way of trying to do that, except that when he, he, when he pulled them all together, he didn't realize that putting them together actually alarmed people. Mm -hmm. They were more alarmed because it was together when they were separately doing it for a, more than a decade. Uh, nobody was particularly alarmed. They looked at some Chinese firms making money, some losing money, some getting some get, getting debt traps for the others, but others are losing a lot of money. But the point is that if you see as a, a series of different enterprises, uh, you know, scattered around, you're not you're not worried. But once the sitting wing went and pull it together, thinking it was a more efficient way or more guided and so on and so forth. And then everybody said, wow, this is a, and the Americans would say, this is a real challenge to our whole system of liberal democracy, liberal capitalism and so on. This is state capitalism or state uh, kind of socialist takeover of, of capitalism uh, to challenge us. And, and if they succeed, people will turn away from liberal capitalism and turn to them. And that would be totally against the interests, the national interests of the United States. I think that I, I can see that why the Americans uh, would see that as a, a real challenge, a fundamental challenge to what they offer the world. They think they've offered the world the best possible thing. And in their eyes, this is true. And to many of us, we get used to it. We also like it in, ma in many ways, it works very well. But when they see the Chinese offering an alternative that some people, particularly some political leaders who see opportunities for staying in power or getting rich and so on, turning to the Chinese way that the state invention is state intervene, intervening in capitalism and getting more and more state control and so on would benefit their countries or themselves, then it will undermine the whole globalization or universalization of what the Americans believe are the best things that they had taken off of the world. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Wang. I think our, our time is up. In fact, we've taken a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, into that five minutes or so, but 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 you know, it was uh, for me. I, I mean, I completely enjoyed your presentation and your broad sweep of history. I mean, you 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 taken us uh, a tour de force, as uh, as Raman says, uh, to understand uh, you know the the current dynamics. I think a lot of a lot a lot of people are either on this side or that side, and I think you've given us very valuable insights into how we should remain as obje objective scholars and understand the situation by, by looking at history uh, and looking at his how history then connects with the present moment and with your, your vast knowledge of China, your, your ability to understand China. Now, I think we have a, a better picture of how the Southeast Asian states, call them Nusantara, call them whatever, uh, should or ASEAN uh, can develop its own agency 
uh, you know, and, and continue with that agency uh, to deal not just with China, but with the, with the other elephants uh, in the room, there could be more than <laughs> two elephants. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think thank you very much for that insight. So it remains uh, for me to thank you on, on behalf of the Academy of Professors of Malaysia uh, for this wonderful, uh, very enlightening lecture. Uh, and I will have to now pass on my uh, role to the, to the MC. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Johan, for moderating uh, the webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have now come to the end of the uh, ceremony. It is hoped that the lecture and discussion that we had will benefit all of us. Uh, on behalf of uh, Secretariat of APM, I would like to thank everyone for the support and cooperation given, without which this webinar could never be realized. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let's take some uh, group photo, please. Uh, photo. <laughs> Can we have a group photo? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. All right. Okay, um, please turn on your uh, camera. Right. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, oops. One, two, three. Okay. The second page. Okay. One, two. One, two, three. Okay. One, two. Three, the fourth page. One, two, three. So many pages. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, one. All right. Okay. That's all. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. All the best. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Prof. Wonderful. Thanks, Zaro. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Johan. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Raman. Hi, Danny. Hi, um, Doran. Hi, Prof. Raman. Hi. Hi. Until I can see a few very familiar names like Kam Heng and all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's all friends. All friends. friends. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, Michael Heng. Yeah. Michael Heng was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good, very good. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure about uh, his friend. Um, what was his name? I think at the height we had about 190 over. Yes, that, that, that was a peak. That and this is on Zoom. No, yeah. I don't, we don't know yet on yeah. YouTube. On YouTube, okay, YouTube as well, yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, we we record it. We can always circulate it again. Yeah. Yes. With yeah. other people. Yeah.